So today we're gonna to be talking about narcissism and intimacy and why it's so difficult to have an intimate relationship with someone who is suffering with NPD. When we are in relationships with people, whether it's a spouse or whether it's with a coworker or with our children, there is and should be a level of vulnerability. Now, in order to become intimately close with another human being, you have to divulge certain things about yourself. You have to share. You have to show this other person who you are. You have to show them your wounds. You have to show them how you feel about certain things. You have to be authentic. You have to share who you really, really are. If you're somewhat of a healthy person and we're all struggling to be healthier, right? We all have stuff and nobody's perfect. And we all have to learn to accept our shadow sides as, you know, as well as our good side. We all have to do that because we all, we are a combination of both. We are dualistic and we're trying to become more whole as people. And so understanding that we're not perfect is part of what it means to be a human being on the personal development path and to be someone who is trying to grow. Now, someone who is healthy understands that they're not perfect. And that they understand that sharing themselves with their partner, with their coworker, it's an opportunity for, you, for them to say, this is who I am. And now please show me who you are. It's a way to get close. It's a way to build trust. If you are with someone that who is trustworthy, they will not use your wounds against you. You will develop intimacy. You will develop a closeness. You will feel like this person trusts you and that you can trust this other person. Over time, the relationship actually grows. You feel safer with this person. You feel more comfortable with this person. You start to experience a level of connection that is beyond the honeymoon phase. It feels solid, it feels strong, and it feels like it could stand the test of time. And it's a really wonderful place to be. Now, when you're in a relationship with somebody who is struggling with narcissism, they don't know they're struggling with narcissism in most cases, but let's say that you've manifested someone with high narcissistic traits in your life. You cannot build intimacy with this person because a narcissist needs to maintain objectivity or distance because a narcissist will feel suffocated by intimacy. A narcissist will fear the vulnerability it takes to be in an intimate relationship so it's almost like showing you their hand, right? So they're playing poker, um, they've got the poker face on and becoming intimate with you is like showing you their hands. They are completely vulnerable and they know that if they get too close to you, you can abandon them, you can hurt them. And so in order for them to maintain control, and in order for them to maintain control over their fantasy of you as well as themselves, they cannot do intimacy. When it comes to intimacy and vulnerability in adulthood, it really does rely heavily on the quality of the nurturing that we received as children. So the more attuned our parents were to us, the more our needs were met, especially when we were powerless little children, the more we felt heard, the more seen that we felt the more psychologically seen, emotionally seen, the more physically seen we felt, right? The more we knew that we could trust that our nurturing was going to be consistent, the more we trust that I, me, I am worthy, and the more we can trust other people. When you are somebody who has never been able to form that bond, and there are many reasons why that could happen in a relationship with a child, when that has been your experience, you cannot develop trust, not that you are enough and not that other people are not going to exploit you, hurt you, persecute you, and discard you. A child that grows up feeling attached, securely attached to their mother, their father, their caretakers, and their family of origin, ends up not being afraid to express their feelings. A child that has grown up feeling loved and, and protected and not criticized and not discarded, not devalued, not gaslighted, not guilted, not shamed, learns that they, they have innate value. So there's no shame in who they are. And that's not the case for most people who have narcissistic personality disorder.
A child who grows up in a home where they're only rewarded if they do what mommy wants or they do what daddy wants is not learning how to trust themselves or to trust their parent. Love is conditional. In fact, they're, they may even get punished or discarded for not doing what mommy or daddy wants. This makes it very difficult for a child who's learning about the world, learning about themselves, makes it diff very difficult for a child whose brain is being wired for socialization and for trust to believe that their needs are important and that they can rely on other people to meet their needs when they need to get their needs met. Another issue that we have when dealing with someone who has high narcissistic traits or who has NPD is that they're always on the hunt for narcissistic supply. So they're always looking for a way to feed their need for emotional speed. They are always looking for another source of, you know, uh, grandiosity. A narcissist lives in a fantasy world. They have a fantasy version of themselves. They have these ideas about themselves, that they're grandiose, that they're better than other people, that they're above other people, right? That they're special, that they're unique. There's something special about them. And their emotions are locked behind sort of like if you think a concrete wall right? They don't want to go there. So they stay outside the concrete wall. They have this false self and they have a fantasy. And when they first meet you, they idealize you. And the more beautiful you are, the more talented you are, the more kind you are, the more balanced you are, the more forgiving, the more empathic, the more you seem to have your life together, the more of a prize you are seen at, by the narcissist. So the, the, the quality of the narcissistic, narcissistic supply goes up. So the more qualities that you have that the narcissist admires, the better for the narcissist. So when we're thinking about intimacy and we're thinking about someone who's a narcissist and they're like this with their friends, that, so they hang out with only people that they think are reflect well on them, right? And that's a form of narcissistic supply. You can't get intimate with this person because it seems like they always, they're looking for something from you, right? So when you are in a trusting, loving relationship, it just is, right? We're sharing. There's a mutual exchange. So I give to you, you give to me. It's balanced. It's equal. There's no hidden agenda. If you are having a rough day, I'm there for you. If I'm having a rough day, you're there for me. You don't devalue me because other people devalued me at work. Or you don't devalue me because I had a need and perhaps, you know, I had some conflict with you and I, you said you were going to take out the garbage. You didn't take out the garbage. Now it smells like, why did you take out the garbage? And now I am, there's no self-reflection on the, on the partner who has narcissism and the person who is holding them accountable now gets chucked into the land of you're no good right? You get, you start to become devalued. So you are idealized in the beginning, which is still not intimacy. It's fake. And, but it supports the fantasy of the narcissist and their version of you has to be idealized because the fantasy has to match in their head. So if they're with you, there has to be a reason that they're with you. And that just completely destroys intimacy because it's fake. Now, in order for you to have intimacy, you have to be with somebody who's honest. Now, uh, you know, we have to be careful here because it, we have to be honest at the appropriate time. I'm not saying that we don't reveal ourselves, but very often those of us, especially codependents and some type, some people with high empathy, they are so thirsty to feel seen because of their own abandonment trauma and their own wounds from childhood that when you meet somebody with high narcissistic traits, that when, they, when they're idealizing you, it feels awesome. It feels like you found the oasis, right? You've, it feels like you've been so thirsty for validation. And what happens when you meet somebody who's a narcissist, they give you that validation. You're the most beautiful person in the world. You're so intelligent. They've never met anyone like you. They can't believe they've never met anyone like you. You're such a, you know, you're so much better than anybody else they've ever met. And it, it can be addictive and that's what the narcissist really wants and the narcissist wants to get you hooked to their to their validation you literally get a hit a dopamine hit when you feel seen when you feel valued so an addiction process begins and so 
in this situation, in order to develop intimacy, you have to be honest. But when we are codependents, we can very easily get hooked quickly. The relationship can start off very, very quickly. So the intensity is like off the chain. We think it's awesome. We found our knight in shining armor or we found, you know, our princess or our queen and we think everything's great. You know, it's intoxicating. We don't realize it's not built on honesty. We don't understand the fantasy mind of a narcissist. We don't understand that we're being idealized. We don't understand that we're being, you know, um, we're being groomed for narcissistic supply, a source of something, you know, we don't understand that. And so it's not built on honesty. Now, in order to be in an intimate relationship, you need honesty and you have to be appropriate with when you reveal something about yourself, right? So when you first meet someone, you have to be careful about what you're revealing. You know, I love the way Brene Brown says, you know, you have to protect, I'm paraphrasing, but you have to protect what's sacred about you. And yes, your wounds are sacred, you know, um, because they can be used against you. And so you have to be very, very careful who you tell about your childhood. You know, um, I have met people in my life who I have told things to, and it is absolutely devastating when the relationship starts to take a downward turn and the person that you trusted with your spiritual boo-boos uses them against you. It is absolutely devastating, right? And if you're somebody with codependency or you're somebody who has high empathy, even if you know something about someone that could destroy them, you won't use it against them. So in my opinion, that seems to be a, a trait that people who have narcissism or suffer with NPD, it seems to be a, a trait that they do have. They will pull that card to humiliate you and to hurt you if they feel like you've slighted them. Another reason that narcissists struggle with intimacy is because in order to create intimacy and strong bonds with somebody, you have to know that you're imperfect and you have to know that your partner's not perfect, right? So they lack object constancy. So when you are a healthy person, you, you know that people in your world are imperfect. You know that your kids are going to bump into walls. You know that they're going to crayon your, your couch. You know that they're babies. You know that this is what they're going to do. You know that when you marry someone and you're in a relationship with someone, they might come home ornery. They might not always do what you want them to do. They might not always respond the way you want them to respond. They have their own stuff too. But you're able to see the value in that person. You're able to see this whole picture. You know, um, I think that my husband and I have a wonderful relationship, but I am, you know, not in any delusional state by any means, um, nor do, do I believe that he's perfect. I can see his flaws and he can see my flaws, you know, and we love each other and we're going to support one another in spite of them. We have mutual respect for one another. I would never exploit my husband and he would never exploit me. So that, that allows our relationship to grow. And so intimacy is not possible for somebody with narcissism because they don't, they can't do that. They can't see themselves. They, they're not self-reflective. They're self-aware, but they're not self-reflective. They know, they have an awareness of self, but they don't self-reflect. They're not looking within. They're not asking themselves like so many people do, like, should I have said that? What, was, what were the consequences of that? Did I hurt her feelings? Was I, you know, too hard on that person? Was I, did I just react? Was I judgmental? Was I too critical? Was I too harsh? Was I in a bad mood and is that why I acted that way? So that, that doesn't happen. And so in order to develop intimacy, you have to be able to see people well, the way they really are, which is good and not so good. So we call this splitting. And so I think what happens, and this is just my humble opinion and based on my experiences, that when you're being idealized by a narcissist, First of all, it feels awesome. You feel seen and you think, oh, this is great, you know, but then when you confront a narcissist about something, they split and you are no longer that person that they put on the pedestal. It doesn't fit. They, they can't make it fit, right? They have to devalue you, push you away, discard you, 
especially if you keep at it and you keep confronting them about things that you don't like, maybe a lie, or maybe you found them, you know, texting another person, another, another partner or whatever. You found something, they moved money around, they didn't tell you and you confront them and this conflicts with their fantasy version of you and that's when they will begin to devalue you. So you cannot create intimacy in a relationship with a narcissist and that's one of the reasons. Another reason that you can't have an intimate relationship with a narcissist is because of the way they view sex. So sex is not about sharing. Sex is about a conquest. Sex is about power. It's about dominance and it's about control. And, you know, sex with a partner should be safe. It should be mutually gratifying. It should be about sharing, you know, this sacred energy with another person. But narcissists don't see sex the way healthy people do. They see it as an opportunity to, um, they see it more in terms of gratifying, uh, having a gratifying sexual experience than sharing an intimate experience, sharing an experience with a lover. They see it more about gratifying their sexual, their sexual craving, and they see it more as an opportunity to perform, right? So even, even your satisfaction ends up being a mirror that supports the fantasy version of the narcissist. So you can't have intimacy when sex is purely about um, performance art, you know, or sex is about dominance, power, and control, and manipulation. A little bit earlier about this idea of self-reflection. In order to develop an intimate relationship with another person, you need to be self-reflective. You need to check yourself. You need to ask yourself, you know, am I the best version of myself in this relationship? Am I being fair-minded or am I being closed-minded? You know, am I being too judgmental? Am I being too codependent? Am I being too needy? Am I expecting my partner to read my mind? Am I being, you know, just a little nasty today because I'm tired? There's this idea of self-reflection and the best relationships um, between people involve the ability to be self-reflective. You want to be able to be someone who asks yourself, you know, am I in the right here? Or did I do something wrong? Why? So that you can fix it, so that you can be humble, so that you can say to your partner or your friend or your coworker, I was out of line. So you can say, I'm sorry. When you're in a relationship with someone who can't take accountability, who can't be self-reflective. So if you're not self-reflective, you can't take accountability, right? So it goes hand in hand. In order to have a really intimate relationship, you really need to be with somebody who has the ability to say, I'm sorry, because there is going to be a point where you have to say you're sorry. You're not perfect. And, you know, the sooner we wrap our minds around this idea that we're not perfect, you know, the better. If you come from a home where you were criticized and you were put down and you were mocked and you were gaslighted, yes, parents gaslight their children. They shame their children they project onto their children, you know, it happens. And if you've come from a home where you were highly criticized, then it might be very difficult for you to say, I'm sorry. But somebody who is not a narcissist has the ability to be self-reflective. Even if they have this type of trauma in their background, they're able to wrap their mind around it and say, okay, yeah, my mom was very critical of me and yeah, I don't like criticism, but yeah, I'm a big girl and or I'm a big boy and I know this wasn't the best version of myself and I really need to make amends. And we can make amends and, and develop intimacy. Another reason that is very difficult, if not impossible, to have an intimate relationship with a narcissist is because they fear abandonment so deeply. Now, what I finally learned, I'm so grateful, you know, being married for the second time to my husband, Anthony, is that I had to accept when I met him, that the relationship could end at any time. And I'm okay with that. It's not that I want it to happen, but I'm not in fantasy mode where I think that this relationship is never going to end. Now, why is that important? It's important because I'm a, I am not tied to the outcome or the fear of abandonment. And people with narcissism are very afraid of abandonment. They're terrified of being left alone it makes them move a little bit closer to 
the feelings that are hiding behind the wall that they don't want to touch, that they don't want to, they don't want to ever climb over the wall and get in touch with that, that feeling of shame that they're not good enough. And so to develop intimacy with someone, you have to know that this person at any time could cheat on you, could die, God forbid, could get sick, could abandon you, might want a divorce, might move away from you. Anything can happen in a relationship. And when you're attached to the fear of being abandoned, you know, you don't behave well in the relationship. You can become suspicious. You can become distrustful. You can become paranoid and even neurotic over where this person is, who they're talking to, who they're texting. When you confront this idea that abandonment is possible in any relationship and you refuse to allow yourself to be ruled by the fear of abandonment, you are free to love in the moment. You are free to enjoy your partner in the moment. Yes, I know that at any point, you know, my husband could want a divorce or my husband could leave me or something else could happen. I know that, but I'm not afraid of that reality anymore. And I really believe that it's in great part due to all of the work that I've did in my life and I continue to do to heal from codependency, to heal from the need to rescue people, to heal from the need to seek external validation, to heal from the need to people please, to heal from the need to tone myself down, to heal from the need to feel unworthy unless I'm doing something for someone else. I don't have that those deep-seated um, compulsions anymore. I've been able to eradicate them, you know, through healing myself with subconscious programming uh, meditations that I've created myself through journaling through learning to not seek validation, really honoring myself and developing myself and coming into alignment with who I really am and not relying on other people. Essentially healing from the trauma from my own background. And codependency, you know, um, most experts agree that codependency is a learned behavior. So my mom was codependent. She was the adult child of two alcoholic parents. You know, my father, in my opinion, is on the spectrum of narcissism. And so they were a hand in a glove. You know, um, my father needed to have his needs met and he needed someone to, to support his fantasy of himself as being awesome and perfect. Um, and my mom was a willing partner. You know, she was perfectly fine to, the, to, to shine that mirror up in his face. And I observed that and I mimicked my mom. Um, and once I was able to see that it wasn't me, it was just my programming, it became... The path to clearing the codependent programs became easier and I was finally able to develop an intimate, more loving, more stable, more fair-minded, more objective, more neutral even, um, reality and perception of myself and other people. Thank you so much for being here. If you're interested in watching my codependency on-demand presentation, you can click the link in the description box. And don't forget to sign up for the codependency quiz. You can do that at my website at www.lisaaramano.com. And if you'd like to listen to one of my books for free, you can do that. Click one of the links in the description box. It'll be taken to audible.com and you can listen for free. Namaste, everybody. Until next time, be careful out there. Bye for now. If you love this content, check out the next video and don't forget to click the link below so you can take the codependency quiz. When you challenge a narcissist, that's when you're going to start to see the shift.